Hello. Hello. Well, welcome. You're welcome. 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 Hello. Welcome. 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 Hello and welcome to our online service from the parish of Herne Hill, where I am a reader in the parish. My name's Adra Ando O'Connell. I'm so glad that you could join me this morning so that we could worship together. This week, while we continue our series Reflections on Romans, we do so with a particular emphasis on the fact that on Sunday, the 22nd of October, our parish is marking Freedom Sunday. This is a response to an invitation from one of our parish mission partners, International Justice Mission, IJM, that we set aside a Sunday to deepen our understanding of God's heart for justice, to discover the realities of modern slavery, and to join the fight to end it. One of our church members, Andy Griffiths, is one of the leadership team of IJM, and he and Rachel Griffiths will be speaking to us about IJM and their work later. And on this particular Sunday, we also hold in our hearts throughout our worship together, God's heart for justice in Israel-Palestine, as we pray for all people there yearning for the freedom to live peaceably with one another. So let's begin our service with a prayer reminding us of why we are coming together. We are worshipping together, wherever we are, as the family of God, in our Father's presence, to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace, that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. Amen. And now we are going to have our first song, a song to lift the heart in hard times. Oh, happy day. Happy day. Oh, happy day. He taught me how. 
turn from singing of the happy day when Jesus washed our sins away, we turn now to our time of confession. So let's take a moment to reflect on our relationship with God, on the shortcomings of our hearts and our actions, perhaps today, last week, or even many years ago. What are the sorries we need to say, the thoughts or words or deeds we need to change? In a moment's silence, let's unburden ourselves before God. Let's confess our failings and our challenges, seek his forgiveness and be freed from their weight. And so we confess together. Please join in with me with the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you, against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And now the absolution. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. And as we continue in our series on reflections on the Romans, we now turn to our Bible reading, which comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve 
If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now over to Andy and Rachel. Hi, I'm Andy Griffiths. I've been coming to St. Saviour's Church in the parish of Herne Hill for around 20 years now. I know, I don't look old enough. Uh, today it's my pleasure to be talking about International Justice Mission, or IJM, who I work for and who are one of the parish's mission partners. Firstly, just a huge thank you to St. Saviour's and to St. Paul's for supporting IJM so faithfully over the years. Rachel and I first became involved in IJM in 2011 when we moved with our family to Chennai, South India, to allow me to take on leading IJM's work in Tamil Nadu combating bonded labour slavery. We returned to the UK in 2014 and I now lead IJM's work in the Africa and Europe region. I want to start with a brief explanation about what IJM does and then tell you a story as a bit of a double act with Rachel. So firstly, what is the problem that IJM is actually addressing? Well, the root of the problem is this. There are five billion people today who live outside the protection of the law. If you live outside of the protection of the law, if you can't call 999 for the police when someone is attacking you or your family, and if you have no money to pay for private security, then you are vulnerable. There is no one to protect you. Someone more powerful than you can oppress you. And that is the situation for 5 billion people today who have no protection from everyday violence and exploitation because they live outside of the protection of the law. What we've seen in that context is that violent crimes go unpunished. Criminals, slave masters, paedophiles, wife murderers can act with impunity. They know they will not be held accountable for their actions. And so they will continue to do appalling violent things to people who can't protect themselves. We see this violence in our work at IJM. It's estimated that today there are 50 million people trapped in slavery, 15 million of them, 15 million of them in South Asia in bonded labor slavery in brick kilns, rice mills, rock quarries, child slavery in fishing and the cocoa industries in Ghana, endemic levels of child sexual assault in Uganda and Guatemala, women being trafficked into forced commercial sexual exploitation from Central and Eastern Europe to UK and other Western European destinations, children in the Philippines being sexually assaulted in front of webcams at the direction of paedophiles in the US and Europe. All of these things are plainly illegal, but they happen when governments are not effectively enforcing the laws which are there to protect the vulnerable. IJM is a global organization which was formed to address this fundamental problem, to strengthen public justice systems to the point where they protect vulnerable people from violence. Our aim is to protect 500 million people in poverty from violence by 2030. Here's where we're working. We're working in these countries against slavery, violence against women and girls, and police abuse of power. Wherever we work, we're trying to do the same thing to strengthen the public justice system to the point where it enforces laws to protect vulnerable people. And we do this by finding individual cases, working with police to find women, men or children who are trapped in violent exploitation and bringing them to safety. Then empowering these survivors on a journey towards restoration to build safe, sustainable futures for themselves. This is important both for the survivor but also for the justice system, because these survivors are the key witnesses about what happened to them. 
We support police and prosecutors to come alongside survivors to work together to hold criminals accountable. That's important because it acts as a deterrent to other would-be criminals. More than 85,000 people have been brought to safety from slavery and other forms of violence. Over 5,700 traffickers and perpetrators have been convicted. Over 347,000 officials and community members have been trained to recognize and respond to slavery and violence. What we've seen is that when you strengthen public justice systems in this way, it does actually work to protect others who would otherwise have been vulnerable. There are nine places where we have commissioned studies in what we call endline studies, which show significant reductions in the prevalence of violent crimes, which we were addressing in those places, from slavery to sexual exploitation of children to violent land theft from widows. More recently, for example, in Tamil Nadu, where I used to work, a study last year showed an 82% reduction in the prevalence of bonded labor slavery in the state. That's 380,000 people who were slaves who are now free. But I wanted to move on from talking in general terms like this about what we do to one particular story, which has been unfolding now over a number of years. Back in 2015, this man, a motorcycle driver called Josephat Mwenda, was stopped by a police officer who shot him in the hand. That officer, this man, Frederick Lelliman, immediately tried to cover up the shooting by taking Josephat to a private rather than a government hospital so that it wouldn't be public. The officer then brought false charges against Josephat for drug possession, gambling and resisting arrest. These were all lies. Josephat was just unfortunate to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, stopped by a policeman who believed that he could act as he wished above and beyond the law without fear of being held accountable. Willie Kamani, a much loved and already highly respected lawyer uh, within IJM, despite his junior years, bravely took on the case. Challenging a powerful policeman in Kenya was risky. Willie knew that, but he chose to pursue the case alongside his courageous client. On June 23rd, 2016, after a court appearance challenging Lelyman's false charges, Willie and Joseph had departed with their driver, this man, Joseph Mayuri. Now, if you follow IGM's work, you'll know what happened next. Tragically and callously, Willie, Joseph had, and Joseph were abducted and held for a few days here in this shipping container at the back of a police station on the outskirts of Nairobi. They were tortured and then murdered by police, ganging together to protect Officer Lelliman. The police acted with no fear and went out drinking afterwards to celebrate what they'd done. It wasn't surprising that they acted with no fear of repercussion before, because before 2016, despite this plague of violence, murder and forced disappearances inflict, inflicted by Kenyan police on those they have a duty to protect, only two police officers in Kenyan history had ever been convicted of murder. After an agonizing few days search for the missing men, with well-attended marches through Nairobi organized by the Kenyan Law Society in support of calls to find the men or produce their bodies, their bodies were found in, flax, in, in sacks floating down the river. IJM Kenya, in deep mourning for their colleague, mobilized to support the investigation and to pressure for action to be taken. In August, two months later, five people, including four police, were arrested and charged with murder. There seemed little hope at that stage that this would lead to conclusions. Benson Shamala, who's the country director for IJM Kenya, tells me that people thought IJM staff would just resign one by one in fear and close shop and that this would be the end of efforts to hold police accountable in Kenya. Verse 12 in today's reading happens to be one of the anchor passages at International Justice Mission. The founder and CEO, Gary Haugen, returns to these 11 words frequently. 
Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. So I want to talk just briefly about hope. We're told in Romans 5 that hope doesn't disappoint us. You, and yet we still often do feel disappointed when our hopes are dashed or that which we hoped for doesn't happen. I'm increasingly convinced that hope is not a feeling. I, I know that we sometimes feel hopeful, but it's also that very feeling which can be the disappointment when it doesn't turn out as we hoped for. So then what is hope? Well, Cynthia Bourgeau, she is a theologian and a contemplative teacher. She says this about hope. Hope is a quality of aliveness. It does not come at the end as the feeling that results from a happy outcome. Rather, it lies at the beginning as a pulse of truth that sends us forth. When our innermost being is attuned to this pulse, it will send us forth in hope, regardless of the physical circumstances of our lives. Hope fills us with the strength to stay present, to abide in the flow of the mercy, no matter what outer storms assail us. Not a feeling, but a quality of aliveness, a pulse. The life in us, which enables us to keep going. And that is what the IJM Kenya team depended on in those six years of waiting. Circumstantially, we might say they had no reason to hope. What hope was there for them when their friend, their colleague, their brother had been kidnapped, tortured and murdered while in the work of pursuing justice? The verse then goes on to say, be patient in affliction. Really? How? Well, perhaps the patience in affliction that we're reading about here comes as a result of being able to hope. Unless we have that hope, surely we can't attain the ability to be patient. And when I think of patience, it feels demure, calm, accepting. But in fact, the Greek word for patient is to be persistent, to refuse to stop, to persevere. So patience might act, act, require us to be still, but it's in an active and intentional way. We know that Paul isn't just throwing around words here. He knew what it was to suffer. He says in Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. International Justice Mission is founded on a rock solid commitment to prayer before all other things. Each day in every office around the world, every staff member will spend 30 minutes at their desk in silent prayer, contemplation, reading in the scriptures. It's actually in their contract to do so. And then every day, in every office around the world, at a given time, in India where we were, it was at 11 a.m., the whole office will stop their work, come together to worship, to sing, to praise, and to pray for the work. And this is in recognition that protecting people from violence, rescuing people from slavery, supporting survivors in their journey towards restoration, 
bringing perpetrators to justice and dismantling systems of injustice is God's work. And we get invited to be a part of it. Back to the story of Willie, Joseph and Josephat. The police were arrested in August 2016. It would take six long years, distressing years, for this trial to conclude, adjournment after adjournment, then COVID and many other delays. Terribly distressing for the victims' families and for IJ in Kenya. And yet they persisted with courage and resilience, honoring Willie, Joseph and Josephat daily by pursuing the case and commemorating them annually at an anniversary held for their deaths. After 46 prosecution witnesses, 34 defense witnesses, 6,114 pages of notes typed by the wonderful Justice Lessett, in August 2022, three police and one civilian informer were convicted of murder, being sentenced later in 2022. Finally, the families could breathe out. Finally, IJM Kenya could thank God that justice had been delivered for their colleague, client and driver. Civil society across the media, Kenyan Law Society, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority in Kenya, and countless others who championed justice in this case could celebrate. And so in June 2023, the seventh annual commemoration of Willie, Joseph and Josephat's death, it was a very different affair to the first six. And I was really blessed to be in Nairobi for that special sacred time. And I wanted just to give you a few highlights from that week. The Law Society of Kenya recreated the march that it had held in 2016. Here we all are. I wasn't sure what to expect. Of course, there was inevitably some sadness. Uh, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, colleagues still grieving. But as we marched, a band struck up and we sang songs of celebration, honoring the faithfulness of God to the saints. There was relief, joy, determination, and a contagious flame of hope that things will change. After about an hour of marching, we arrived at Bilamani Court, where the trial had taken place. The Kenyan Law Society had organized a special court ceremony to honor Willie, Joseph and Josepha. It was extremely moving to hear the president of the Law Society of Kenya say that Willie's example challenged him to seek justice for those who need it but can't afford to pay for it. The president responded publicly accepting that challenge and he invited others in the Kenyan legal profession to do the same. Justice Commander Kani summed up for the bench, emphasizing that Willie had not died in vain and that the Mavoko case had set several important precedents which will pave the way to ending police violence in Kenya. But this photo captures the moment that most moved me in court that day. Listening to IJM attorney Edward Mbanya honoring his good friend and colleague, Willie, Eddie explained what kind of man Willie was, the caring father, the loving husband, and the diligent, creative, and contagious lawyer, courageous lawyer. Eddie concluded, Willie's case was not in vain. His killing has reawakened a fresh desire against, to fight against police impunity in Kenya. Eddie's right, I'm told he normally is. Before the Mavoko III trial began, only two cases in Kenya's history had been convicted of, uh, only two police in Kenya's history had been convicted of murder. But emboldened by the progress and by the publicity around the Mavoko III trial, between 2016 and 2022, 32 police officers have been convicted of murder or manslaughter, 32. I could see this contagious hope in other events over the course of the week. I visited Kayoli Justice Center and spoke to Faith and her team pictured here. They live in an informal settlement which has for decades cowered in terror of police violence. I went around the room asking Faith and her team how confident that they were that they would win the battle against police violence. Every single one of them said that now that they are actually seeing the police held accountable, they know they will win. Mavoko 3 has changed the weather. The final event of the week was hosted by IJM in a hotel in the middle of Nairobi. This was the culmination of the week. Speech after speech from government officials, police, 
prosecutors, university academics, survivor groups, media campaigners, and others, all talking about how the Mavoco 3 case forms a platform to move now to an accountable police force in Kenya. And there's one more memory that I want to leave you with from this week, two more actually. Uh, the first is something said by Saidi Kipratik, who's a senior police officer in the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, who supported the initial stages of the investigation so well. This is Saidi who's holding the microphone. The formal panel at which he was contributing had finished. He turned to the families of Willie, Joseph and Josephat, and he said this. As a member of the National Police Service, and one of the team that was involved in unmasking the killers, I would like to tell the families something that has nagged me since we took up this daunting task. To Willie, Joseph and Josephette's families, I'm sorry. As members of the police force, instead of investigating who did this to you, we should have protected you, sorry. And to all IJM staff, thank you for believing in us. Thank you for not letting this go until justice was served. You could see in the room how powerful this apology from the police was to the families. The second thing that struck me at the event was the extraordinary bravery and courage of Hannah Kimani, Willie's, uh, Willie's widow and mother of their two sons. She has paid such a great price and shown such extraordinary patience, actively seeking justice for seven years. She spoke bravely at the event acknowledging the huge significance to her and the other victims' families of receiving justice. In her speech, she mentioned that her son, Castro, wants to be a police officer when he grows up, and her other son, Patterson, wants to be an investigator. That just goes to show the depth of her hope for the transformation in the policing in Kenya, which she's passed to her young sons. So the seventh commemoration of the uh, at the anniversary of the death of Willie, Joseph and Josephat was an incredible week. It was very different to the first six. IJM Kenya are an amazing team and they are achieving extraordinary transformation in Kenya. We're seeing tangible examples of that transformation. The number of convictions of police for abuse. The new Kenyan president, Mr. Ruto, ordering the disbandment of the police special services unit which had been notoriously linked to a number of extrajudicial killings. Here's a short clip of Benson Shamala recorded earlier this week, telling us what gives him hope. Greetings from IJM Kenyatta, joy to be meeting you at such a time as this. We recognize the unique opportunity that we have at the moment to influence the trajectory of the Kenyan justice system towards full accountability for the police following the success of the Mavoko 3 case. And it's not going to be easy, but we have seen encouraging signs that give us hope that God's justice will at last prevail. Before June 2016, despite the long history of police violence against Kenyans, only two police officers had been convicted of murder. The system was set up to put police in a position of an accountable, immense power over the people. And nothing an ordinary citizen could do to stand up against such power and such abuses. But in the last seven years since the Mavoko 3 case that sparked a national protest for police accountability, we have seen over 32 police officers convicted for murder or manslaughter with many, many other cases in court. We have seen police leaders speaking out against police violence. In June this year, we held a commemorative event for Willie Joseph and Josephat. At that public event, a senior police officer apologized to the families on behalf of the entire police for not protecting the three. Moments like this give me great encouragement and hope to believe that we are at the tipping point for justice in Kenya. William Wilberforce said three things are necessary to end slavery. Awareness, prayer, and money. Awareness, well, we've been made aware today of the colossal crime of injustice. And we've shared how prayer has brought about miraculous change. The parish of Herne Hill prays regularly for IJM and the organization is so very grateful. Please continue to do so. If you, however, would like to receive prayer updates individually, 
then we can show you how to do that in just a moment. If you sign up for prayer as a prayer partner, you will receive regular emails and updates with prayer requests and also sharing news of answers to prayer. So that's awareness and prayer and finally money. We are again, hugely grateful for the generosity of the parish of Herne Hill and the regular financial giving that they offer to IJM. There are further programs in Africa and in Central and Eastern Europe, which IJM is now ready to begin. What holds them back is funding. So you might feel that in addition to the gifts which the parish already gives to the organization, that as an individual, you would like to become a freedom partner with a regular donation to IJM. So you can do that by scanning this QR code on your phone and it will take you directly to the correct part of the IJM website where you can sign up as a freedom partner for prayer and or for giving financially. And if that doesn't work for you, please contact the parish office and we will support you in accessing the website. Thank you for your love, your generosity and your support. We're going to pray in response uh, by singing. And we're gonna sing a song called The Justice Song which has been written by Kane Christie, who uh, was with the organization for many years and who opened the first office, uh, IJM office in Ghana. So uh, use this as your prayer and enjoy the singing, which is done on this video by members of IJM staff from around the world. Justice. Yeah. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We won't relent. We will fight until the end. We have been sent to protect and to defend We won't relent We will fight until the end We have been sent To protect and to defend Let justice flow like a river Flow from the peaks Justice flow like a river Till only free doubt is found We count the cost We will pledge our very lives All flesh and blood But the kids are well Oh, 
With thanks to Andy and Rachel and the work of IJM, we now turn to our time of prayer. And so we pray. God of justice and joy, on this day we designate Freedom Sunday. We thank you for the freedom we have to come together, remotely or in person, to freely worship you to bring the joys and burdens of our heart before you and seek your forgiveness, your wisdom and your comfort. On the 20th of January this year, the Jerusalem Southwark Covenant Agreement was signed by Bishop Christopher and the Archbishop in Jerusalem, the Most Reverend Sir Hale Dewani. This covenant formally linking both our diocese. Create a God. We lift your creation in this diocese of Jerusalem, covering five countries, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Syria and Lebanon. It is home to almost 30 parishes. We lift before you, Lord God, in earnest prayer, the body and spirit of Archbishop Sahel and all the souls in his care in those 30 parishes our covenanted brothers and sisters. We lift before you, Creator God, all the souls in those five countries. We pray for the nations and the peoples of the world suffering under cruel regimes, under war, under natural disaster and human-made environmental catastrophe. We lift all those longing for freedom to live the blessed, abundant lives you made us for and made the world around us for us to live and flourish and delight in. We thank you for hearts that long for delight, that glory in kindness and laughter and joy. We ask your blessing and your encouragement for the peacemakers, for all those at IJM working to release your children into the freedom of your abundant world. May our prayers, our donations, our love and support stiffen their sinews 
and renew their resolve, knowing that we are so grateful to them for the work they do on our behalf to bring in God's kingdom come. And finally, we lift all those known to us who are in need of your comforting arms around their shoulders. Perhaps they are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Lord, we lift them to your tender care, to your mercy, to your comfort. And now we end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we come to our next hymn, And Can It Be? Thank you. 
So now, as we come to the end of our service together, may I encourage you, if you want to know what's happening in the parish now and over the next few weeks, to go to our website for details of all the notices of things that are taking place. And so, now we end our time together by praying for each other with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.